Uh, welcome to all of you to this year's Teaching and Learning Conference. Um, at this year's Teaching and Learning Conference, we're aiming to cover two themes, um, teaching excellence and internationalisation. And through those two themes, we'll be asking questions including what the impact of the Teaching Excellence Framework, the TEF, will be for Queen Mary. Um, also, what teaching excellence looks like um, for our institution in a range of international contexts and how internationalisation in its many forms affects our teaching. Um, the programme for the day features um, a mixture of lectures and workshops showcasing examples of best practice in teaching and learning across Queen Mary's three faculties. Um, and I hope that everyone will have an opportunity to meet with colleagues and to share ideas and to share um, best practice. Um, many of you who've been in the octagon and had um, a bite of lunch will have seen our poster presentations, which are from the winners um, of the 2015 Westfield Fund um, for enhancing the student experience and also from the Drapers Fund um, for innovation in learning and teaching. Um, and you may have noticed if you've already seen the posters and there will be an opportunity throughout the rest of the afternoon if you haven't yet to um, vote on which poster you think is most inspirational. Um, the prize will be awarded at the start of this afternoon's Drapers Lecture so voting will close um, at 20 past four, seems very precise. Um, the voting box is in the octagon next to the registration desk, which is in the middle of the room. So if you haven't done so already, I do encourage you to look at the posters and, and to vote for, for your winning, um, winning one. So today is also the launch of this year's Westfield Fund grant scheme. Um, and as many as, of you will know, this is an annual scheme which provides funding um, for both small and large projects to enhance the student experience at Queen Mary. So schools, institutes, um, the Queen Mary Students' Union, pro professional services are all open um, to make applications to the fund um, to support projects with the specific aim of um, improving the experience of all of our students. There are flyers available in the octagon um, and uh, you're also welcome to speak to any member of the um, Centre for Academic and Professional Development, CAPD, if you want to have some further information about the Westfield um, grant scheme. Um, in the octagon, you'll also be able to take a look at the work of our educational development team from CAPD, and this includes information about our teaching recognition project, which helps um, all of our staff to gain HEA fellowship, and there's also information on the wealth of resources on teaching and learning offered by our, our ADEPT programme. So finally, um, before I uh, move on to introducing our plenary speaker for today, um, I just want to invite you and hope that you'll be able to join us for what promises to be a really exciting conclusion of the day's events with our 11th, <coughs> 11th um, annual Draper's Lecture on Teaching and Learning this evening. Um, it's been presented by Dr. Joe Beale um, and is entitled Intellectual Property, Rights, Risks and Rebellions in International Higher Education. Um, just uh, some practical details. We're not expecting a fire alarm this afternoon. Um, so if the fire alarm does um, sound, then please do make your way to the assembly point B in Geography Square. Um, don't use any lifts, and if you do require assistance, then um, please make your way to the fire refuge point, which is just outside um, the entrance of this room. So, um, now it's my delight to um, uh, welcome our plenary lecturer for today, uh, Chris Millward, um, who is speaking on Higher Education Reform 2.0, Quality, Competition and Choice. Chris is Director Policy for the Higher Education Funding Council for England, HEFKE, 
Um, Chris oversees the Research, Education and Knowledge Exchange Directorate, um, which informs Hefke's funding to universities and colleges and advises government. Um, and Chris has particular leadership of the education and skills um, environment, including postgraduate policy and funding. Um, in a previous times, Chris has worked for the Arts and Humanities Research Council and has had positions at the University of Warwick, Edinburgh and Durham. Um, there is a full biography in your programme, so I won't go into too much further detail. Um, but of course, it's very timely for Chris talking to us today with the deadline for TEF submissions by noon tomorrow. Um, and Chris is going to explore, unless, unless you've changed your plans, um, the reasons for the government's higher education reforms um, that are currently going through Parliament and key issues for universities ari arising from those reforms. So over to you, Chris. Welcome. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. So I, I knew already, I hope this is on, uh, I, I knew already that uh, this was a distinctive university in terms of its research mission, its student population and links with the local community, but everything I've seen outside, and particularly the chance to see the posters, has confirmed that even more. So it's a great privilege to be able to talk today. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, the government's higher education reforms, and as has been mentioned already, the teaching excellence framework. Um, I've labelled this higher education reform 2.0 because in many ways the reforms that are being proposed at the moment might be seen as unfinished business from changes the coalition government started from 2010 onwards and and really what the, the labeling quality competition and choice these are things that that government thought it was addressing and promoting when it made the changes in 2010-11, uh, but it feels it needs to do more, either because, uh, to a certain extent, it's untrammeled by coalition, so it has more scope to do what it wants to do, but also some of the patterns over the last few years haven't taken it as far as they, they want to. So, so that's the background to what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about um, what's happened since 2012, um, try and picture the landscape now, um, what the purpose of the bill that's going through the House of Lords at the moment and then back into the House of Commons is, and how that may change, given the nature of the current debate. And then again, the purpose of the TEF, um, which has been mentioned, uh, opens tomorrow, and how submissions are going to be assessed. And hopefully that will have some resonance with everything that you're doing. I will not be saying anything that will be useful at all for your TEF submission tomorrow. We're absolutely past that point, um, but hopefully it will give you a sense about how it may play out in, into the future. So to start with, uh, it's worth rolling back to 2010. Uh, so after May 2010, there was, of course, a coalition government, and its number one priority for the government was to reduce public spending and to reduce the deficit. And it was expected that higher education would play its part in that. But there was a kind of conundrum with higher education. So the government, on the one hand, wanted at least as many people to go into higher education um, it wanted to reduce the spending on higher education, but it wanted to maintain the funding of higher education, in part because of the impact of that on the quality of teaching in universities, but also because of the broader uh, underpinning of research and universities standing in the world, which the government strongly believed in. So it had this kind of problem about how to do all those three things. Um, that problem was really addressed through the proposals in the Brown Review, which is shown on the left-hand side, which suggested a massive shift, £3 billion, from Hefke teaching grant to student loans and, and, and grants to a certain extent, but largely student loans. So students would be paying for the majority of the cost of teaching in universities. Um, uh, alongside that, and shown on the right-hand side, there was a white paper in 2011, which had a kind of ideology of greater competition within it. And so it highlighted a desire to give better information to students. If students were paying, they should have better information and advice to support their choices, given the consequences. Um, there was a belief that uh, there should be more competition between universities, both by removing controls on admissions in terms of numbers, but also bringing new types of universities into play, enabling what we call alternative providers to come into play. 
um, and reducing the barriers in the system. So there's a desire for greater competition. We're at the heart of everything that was proposed in 2011. Um, there weren't any proposals comparable to what the TEF is proposing now, i.e. differential grading of quality. And the assumption was that there would be a threshold for quality run by the QAA. Um, but once, that, once you were through that point, the, the market itself, competition, would have, have virtuous effects. That's the kind of thinking that was behind the paper in 2011. So what has happened since? Um, so on a number of levels, you could argue that what, was, what the government aimed for has been achieved. So if you just take income to start with, and you look at the switch between the hefty teaching grant and the student fees, you can see that actually the student fees, and this, this, uh, this shows the university's own actual uh, financial statements and their forecasts, the student fees outweigh the reduction in hefty grants. So the hefty grant is the bottom part of the bar going down quite radically, even before 2012, but also after then. And the bit above the bar, the bit, bit above that part of the bar in yellow is the student fees. And so you can see that the income for teaching in universities has actually gone up over the period. So you could argue at one level um, that that part of the reform has worked. Um, of course, at another level, one of the key concerns in 2012 was that if you increase the price of anything, the demand for it will go down. Um, so if you triple the tuition fees to £9,000, that will have an effect on participation. Um, and yet, or if you look at these numbers, which are the UCAS data, um, we are above the levels we were before the reforms. So of course there was a dip in the first year of the reforms, not least caused by people uh, avoiding a gap year beforehand to avoid paying the higher fee. But for the most part, full-time demand at least, has continued to increase. And there's no sign of a clear difference between England, uh, where fees have increased radically, um, and Scotland and Wales, where they haven't. There's no clear you know, difference between other parts of the UK and England. So at that level, in terms of student demand, you could also say that what was hoped for has been achieved. Another key concern and linked to that was that the fee would have the most effect on the students least likely to enter higher education, those from the lowest income backgrounds. Um, we measure this most commonly through POLAR, which essentially divides the population into five and looks at its likelihood to participate in HE. And what this chart shows you with the bottom line is that the lowest participation group has, has increased at least as much as the others, if not more. So there doesn't seem to have so far been an effect where the increase in the fee seems to have disadvantaged certain groups of students. Um, another area of concern would be that, uh, well, in this new environment, uh, students will have different expectations. Uh, you will see that reflected in, for example, uh, their response to the National Student Survey. Um, and in the first year where, uh, essentially, the end-of-year cohort was completing the NSS, many people were expecting a reduction in the returns provided. But that, again, has not transpired. So overall satisfaction appears to have held up. The sector appears to continue to be making progress on areas where the greatest concerns, at least according to the NSS, for example, <coughs> assessment and feedback, which is the bottom part of the bar, the above bottom line that you can see increasing through there. So also, if you look at what students are saying, um, there doesn't seem to have been a negative effect since 2012. One of the key goals, as I mentioned, was uh, increasing competition. So enabling students to move around, in particular enabling student choice to be recognised. If you take tariff point entry as a kind of proxy for the more popular universities, then you would say students want to go to the highest tariff universities. So have, have the reforms and the removal of barriers to competition enabled those institutions to grow? And again, over the last three to four years, I think you can see that is the case. So uh, the, d the darkest blue line here is the highest tariff universities. The light blue line at the top is the medium tariff universities. And the green line is the lowest tariff universities. And I think what you can see here is that the highest tariff universities have grown um, since 2012, most dramatically across this. The medium tariff universities have also grown to a degree, but not to the same extent. And the low tariff 
are really flattening off now. And indeed, I think when, when you get the UCAS results next week, for next year, you'll see a, a compounding of this trend. In other words, high tariff at least holding up, if not increasing, and the lowest tariff institutions declining. So you could argue that what you're seeing is greater competition, the places students want to go being able to expand, and that in itself achieving some of the things the government wanted to achieve. So on the basis of that, why change anything? Um, you've achieved the kind of three key things you wanted to achieve in 2012. Does the system need further reform? And that is, of course, one of the things that people are saying as the bill goes through Parliament at the present time. Well, here's some of the ingredients why the government might be wanting to change things further. Um, as I mentioned, there was a great desire for, uh, uh, when the reforms happened three years ago or so for new providers to come into the system. So there was a belief that different types of providers would, would, would have different types of provision, more part-time, more flexible provision, and they in themselves would provide competition to the established universities. A kind of, I think the phrase that was used by the minister at the time was the tide that lifts all boats, essentially. Um, if you look at what's happened over the last couple of years, there are a lot of what we call alternative providers. So, so, so the, uh, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see there's very large numbers of providers you know, in their hundreds, but actually they have very few students. So there's only about 10 that have more than around 1,000 students, which is tiny relative to universities like this and indeed most universities across the country. So the penetration of new providers into the system is pretty small at the present time. And of course they have been very vocal in arguing to the government that there are barriers to them getting into the system. They can't get access to the kind of things um, that universities have, freedom toward degrees, and they feel that they're constrained by validation requirements, for example, and they have lobbied very hard to, 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 to have access to university title, degree awarding powers, and the kind of access to loans also that, that the established sector has. So that has been quite influential in some of the thinking that has informed the bill. Um, as I mentioned already, alternative providers were seen as being a source of innovation. And actually, if you look at the data on who they teach and how they teach, they do have more part-time students. They do run more shorter degrees, intensive programs. Um, they do have a good track record in recruiting students who um, come from uh, less traditional backgrounds for HE. Um, and, and so that's one of the reasons why the government is interested to bring them in. If you look at the established sector through the HESA data, part-time study has dramatically declined. So a very different pattern to the bars I showed earlier about full-time entry. Um, the purple line second down from here is part-time undergraduate entrance. And that has reduced by more than half um, over, over the period. It was happening already before 2012. It was affected by cuts in public spending and investment by public services in part-time education. But it's been compounded by the loan scheme, which hasn't really worked well for adults in the workforce. Um, and there's a view now, I think, that what's happened since 2012 is a degree of entrenchment around a three-year three full-time model, um, campus-based model, and a need for innovation in the system in order to, to open it up more to different models of provision, which reflected to agree in that. A further issue to flag is the way in which students paying higher fees has changed the way in which higher education is perceived publicly, in the public debate about education, in the media, but also how it's perceived by um, competition and consumer authorities like the Competition and Markets Authority and bodies like which. So in the public debate, as there has been for some time, but more and more now that higher fees are being paid, there is more debate about what students are getting and there is the running theme around, for example, contact hours. So on the right-hand side, the HEPI HEA survey, which gathers evidence on this each year, has prompted a running debate about the contact students have and the correlation between that and their perceptions of value for money. So, so that's out there, whether we like it or not, and is informing thinking. Alongside that, you have the CMA. Uh, you have WITCH producing various publications highlighting what information was made available to students when before they started, and whether universities followed through on that, for example, in relation to charges, for relation to teaching um, that are received, for relation to out, in relation to the outcomes 
from higher education. And then you have the CMA, the competition body, essentially setting expectations for universities about what they will provide to students in terms of information and their follow through on all of that. So this is all really um, quite a different world and one that's been caused by um, uh, ca caused by the increase in fees to a certain extent and one which again I think is profoundly influencing the government in terms of its thinking about the higher education bill. If you come to the specific issue of teaching quality um, which is of course where we get to when we start talking about the TEF, um, in a, through a CMA lens um, if you're somebody working in the CNA, CMA um, you believe that there is asymmetric information about quality. Students can never know um, what they need to know when they're making their choice about higher education, about the quality of what they're getting. And so there's a, a view that something needs to be done to address, uh, to address that gap. If you're a politician, and this is true in the last government, not just this one, you also think that's compounded to a degree by the performance incentives in universities. So there is a ref. Um, there is competition for research council funding. The performance incentives are strongly oriented towards research, certainly in research intensive universities. So if you align that with the degree to which competition it has difficulties with driving quality in higher education, you believe that something must be done about that. And so that's again some of the thinking that is driving the introduction of the TEF and the other measures that are proposed in the higher education bill. So all of which bring us to essentially last year. So in May last year, uh, the government published a white paper, Success as a Knowledge Economy, which is shown on the left-hand side, and a draft bill, Higher Education and Research Bill, which is the bill that's now going through Parliament and subject to uh, a lot of debate and a huge number of amendments currently in the House of Lords. Um, in many ways, the white paper is, is a kind of political positioning document and probably not worth spending a lot of time on it. The bill is hugely important because it's the first statutory uh, legislation on higher education for a generation and the decisions that are taken now will have implications for a very long period to come and that's why it's occupying a lot of time uh, at the moment. Um, if you look at what's in the bill, I mean crucially what it's doing is setting up a market regulator, the Office for Students, and then separately a research, strategic research funding agency bringing together the research councils and Hefke's research funding and then a really quite different set of duties around those things. It's very much, I think, responding to some of those patterns that I've tried to set out in the first part of this session. Um, and you can see that if you look at Clause 2. Um, so this is Clause 2 of the Higher Education Bill, which essentially sets the duties for the Office for Students. And you can see three themes that I've highlighted already at the heart of this, so greater choice and opportunities for students, um, encouraging competition between higher education providers and promoting value for money. Those are all themes that, are, that, 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 that I guess have been areas where the government feels it needs to go further than it's able to have been so far. And then also, crucially, I think there's two other important elements to this. One is promote quality. So whereas in 2011 the thinking was there's a quality threshold and then uh, it's, for, it's for student choice and competition to resolve the quality issues, there's a clear desire explicitly to promote quality and a clause in the bill, clause 25, that enables the Office for Students to create ratings of higher education providers and communicate those. Um, and there's also importantly um, a clause around uh, and duties around equality of opportunity. So still a very strong widening participation mission here for the Office for Students and indeed not just framed as access to higher education but success in and beyond higher education um, entrenched in the role of what's currently the Director of Fair Access becoming a Director of Fair Access and participation. So, so, so a duty there to promote choice and competition but also explicit duties uh, where you're essentially saying that competition alone won't achieve this around quality and equality of opportunity. And this is, of course, the area that's a, uh, a huge source of debate currently um, in the House of Lords. Once you've established the Office for Students, what happens to what Hefke does on research and, indeed, on knowledge exchange? Um, a lot of the framing of this for the Office for Students is treating learning and teaching, it seems to me, as a private good, essentially paid for 
by students and being regulated by the government as a private good. The research world is completely different. So research, there is increasing public investment in research, more announcements post-Brexit on public spending on research. Um, what the government is essentially saying is research is a public good and it needs strategic oversight and that's what it's doing through UKRI, the body that will oversee all of that. And of course that creates real challenges for universities because you straddle all of those activities and you won't be able to just engage with HEFI, one body in the future. These will, if the bill goes through, be paired apart with quite different imperatives into the future. Um, you may well be looking at the coverage of the debate currently. Um, uh, we've been through the report stage of the House of Commons and we're now in the House of Lords. The government always knew that the House of Lords would be more challenging, not least because there's a whole host of expertise on higher education in the House of Lords, lots of former academics and senior managers from universities, lots of chairs of governing bodies. Um, uh, you only need to read the last private eye to see how many people contributing to the debate have an interest in higher education of one form or another. And that's meant there's a huge number of amendments and a lot of discussion about whether this direction of travel <coughs> is where the nation wants to be. Um, the government has already agreed a number of amendments, which are essentially its own amendments, so changes it wanted to make. It wanted to provide, uh, make clear there will be continued oversight of financial sustainability in higher education, the kind of work that HEFKI does to provide assurance about the financial health of the sector. It's agreed to have student representation on the governing body of the Office for Students, which you might expect. It's made more explicit that an activity that would obviously sit between the Office for Students and the research body, Knowledge Exchange, will be a, a priority and a function of the bodies. And it's made clearer the role of the Director for Fair Access. But these are all things the government itself has wanted to do and has made clear. Um, there's been one amendment where the House of Lords has had a vote and that has been agreed. That related to the character of universities and university autonomy and gets into the territory of university title. And you can see there where the House of Lords is, express, is, 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 is giving a lot of effort and emphasis. And then one of the key questions is where the government will go on this broader territory around university autonomy, issues like degree, stand, degree standards, who gets university title, etc. The, 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 I've flagged four areas, and this is just a personal view, you know, four areas where which are real areas of traction, it seems to me, and where the bill may change. Uh, university title and degree awards, um, the oversight of standards in higher education, and how easy it is to get university title and what you've got to demonstrate to get that. The tension at the heart of the, so, so the strong thrust in the duties of the Office of Students around competition, um, and the potential tension there between the interests of the nation and indeed particular places with regard to, 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 to higher education. So will there be a more explicit reference to the importance of collaboration, where that's in the interest of local areas or in the interest of, 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 the, of the nation? And, and the general thrust of the nation post-Brexit perhaps takes you more in that territory. Um, also the tension between the consumer interest and the broader public and national interest. Um, the tension between teaching and research, and the government's already tried to fill that gap by saying how Office for Students and UKRI will work together, but it may well say more about that. And then the big concerns that relate to uh, the TEF in particular. So what you would be saying to the world if you graded a university bronze, and concerns that are out there about the extent to which that could in any way be linked to immigration regulations. So those are all key areas of debate and areas where it would be interesting to see how the House of Lords discussion in particular plays out. All of that brings me on to the TEF, and I'm going to uh, finish off by talking a bit about how the TEF is intended to evolve during the next few years, and then how it's working in the year we're in now, which is called year two um, of the exercise. Um, so in broad terms, the government has framed this as a, as a kind of evolving exercise. Um, last year, called year one, um, any institution with a satisfactory quality assessment position has been able to um, increase its fee cap um, by, from 2017-18. So that's already very much in motion. The exercise where the submission deadline is tomorrow is called Year 2. 
And this is the first serious presentation of evidence and assessment of that evidence with differential grading outcomes. This will run in the academic year 16-17 uh, and it will have an effect on fee levels in 2018-19. It's voluntary. Institutions don't have to participate. You may have seen press coverage this morning suggesting that quite a lot in Scotland are not can, going to participate, not least because they don't have the fee imperatives. Um, but, but those who do, in year two, if you participate, you will, you'll be able to get the fee uplift, albeit there won't be differentiation according to the grade. That's the current expectation. Uh, the grade from year two will last for three years, so you can keep the grade for up to three years, but some institutions may come back in in year three. So this will run in 1718, affecting fees in 1920. And I think the expectation is that institutions that want to improve their grade may come back in, although there may be some that didn't enter at all and will come through. And then there is a further iteration in what's called year four, where there is discussion about whether it will evolve actually from institutional level to subject level. And this, this kind of sets out how the government expects that may all play out. Um, this year is labelled a trial. Um, it's a trial with huge consequences huge reputational consequences for institutions, and that's been made very clear to the government. Uh, but there is also a clear expectation that the government will learn the lessons from this year. It's never been done before. We haven't got a clue what's going to be in the 15-page submissions that we get tomorrow. So there will need to be a very uh, uh, important exercise to look at the lessons learned from this year and to build that in to the, uh, the approach for future years. The expectation is that the future is there will be differentiation in fees by grading um, and that also some of the metrics, some of the data and the outcomes from that data that are being used in the exercise will evolve. Um, in particular, the government's very interested in how employment data will evolve. It's got access to new sources of data on that. And it's interested in other indicators it could bring into play to understand learning and teaching beyond the one thing that everybody has now which is the National Student Survey. So I'm just going to talk about the current exercise, what we call Year 2. And this is the timeline for the current exercise. Um, so this began last May, where the government essentially published a consultation document on how it might work. Um, they then appointed a chair for the exercise, who's Chris Husbands, Vice-Chancellor of Sheffield Hallam, formerly at the Institute of Education in UCL. And we, as Hefke, as the body delivering it, appointed a number of panellists and assessors. Um, we received 1,200 applications to serve, and we've appointed around 20 panellists and around 20 assessors. Um, the application submission deadline is tomorrow. Uh, we've already done some training of assessors, but we then get into really serious training very early in February using real applications. And then there will be a process of assessment that flows through from all of that with outcomes at the end of May. So we're currently expecting that there will be a publication of outcomes from the exercise probably in the last week of May, and then you get into that further iteration that I was describing earlier on. One of the key critiques of the government when it first started to talk about this was that uh, we're concerned that, 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 that this could be very narrowly conceived in that it may have a perception of what excellent teaching is, which could be quite narrow, um, and that any assessment would reflect that. There has been quite a lot of work to move away from that, and I think that's reflected to a degree in the assessment criteria that are being used for the exercise, which are very broad, and it should be possible for any type of institution, whatever the subject spread, whatever the, the profile of students, to play into the broad assessment criteria that have been identified. So there are three broad headings being used. These are essentially the reference points for the decisions that will be made by the panel and the assessors. They cover issues like student engagement, the culture of learning and teaching in the institution, the way in which, uh, the way in which feedback supports student progression. They look at how the university uses the resources at its disposal, uh, the extent to which learning is integrated with scholarship and research and professional practice, um, the degree to which learning may reflect the needs of individual students, and then in the third column, the whole territory of 
where students go to uh, at the end, which I know has been a, a, a point of, of strategic interest in this university. So what are the employment and further study outcomes? What are the skills that students take into the world at the end of their studies and how, the, how is the institution supporting that? And to what extent are outcomes, successful outcomes achieved from students from all different types of backgrounds, uh, particularly in the context where we know there are differential outcomes for students from certain backgrounds. So that's the kind of reference point for the decision making that the panel will make. Um, the panel, as I said, is chaired by a vice chancellor. Um, it is largely populated by academic peers, um, but there are, I think, five students on it as well. There's then a pool of assessors with a similar balance, largely um, academic staff and students. But we also have two uh, specialists on, uh, on widening participation issues on the one hand and employer perspectives on another, who are not assessing individual applications but just providing advice on how the exercise works. Um, we're expecting that each submission will initially be assessed by um, uh, a group of two academics and one student, one of which will be a panel member. Um, they will then work with a group of nine, so the groups of three will get together with nine to calibrate their thinking and they will reach initial conclusions which will then be taken forward to the panel uh, which will ultimately make decisions. And there will be quite a lot of thematic discussion as well in the midst of all of that about problematic issues that are arising from that assessment. So that's the kind of broad pattern of how the assessment will, man out, will map out. There's been a lot of discussion about the extent to which metrics um, will drive the outcome. Um, there are three sets of core data that are available for all universities um, uh, in, in, in the UK, the National Student Survey, non-continuation data, and employment outcomes through the relatively short cycle survey <coughs> of the Delhi. Um, they are all in there. They're all benchmarked according to factors that uh, are identified as being beyond the institution's control but do affect the outcome. Um, and then there's a look at where the outcome is for the institution relative to that benchmark expectation. Um, the way it's mapped out in the government specification is that an initial assumption will be made based on performance against those core metrics. But I do need to emphasise that that is just an initial assumption. There would be no point having the panel or the assessors if that was the end of the process. So there will be an initial assumption based on that and also an analysis of the data, not just at the headline institutional level, but how it relates to different categories of students. Then there'll be a look at the submission, um, and then a holistic judgment made on all the evidence available, which will lead to the grade. And I think it's inevitable, one of the key critiques of the exercise has been this doesn't fit easily with three bald grades, so it is inevitable that the panel will spend a lot of time looking at the boundaries between the ratings that the, that the government has established for it. So that's broadly how we expect it to play out over the next few months. Key issues for the future will be, one, have we been able to run a robust process? Uh, has the evidence that we get tomorrow been uh, given as the evidence needed to make judgments and have the assessors been able, felt that they've been able to make robust judgments on the basis from it. That needs to flow through to the lessons learned work. We don't yet know how influential the outcomes will be for students when they're making their decisions about where to study, although of course the government has strong ambitions in that territory, or how it will affect university behaviour. And again, the government has strong ambitions about that. We do have a sense from talking to universities over the last few months, and I think Chris Husband as the chair would say the same, that the tech is causing institutions centrally really to unpack what is happening uh, on learning and teaching with their institutions and look at how that works and look at how it relates to the outcomes achieved for students. So it is focusing minds on learning and teaching, uh, but we'll be interested to know uh, whether we can understand that effect. There is then an evolution expected possibly new metrics coming into play. Um, we need to review whether the approach to assessment is the right one, um, given the experience this year. And then there's quite a debate about whether actually this should work at institutional level um, or it should work at subject level, and indeed whether it should just be at undergraduate level, as it is now, or extend also to taught postgraduate level. And it seems to me the key issue there is um, 
it may well be that uh, subject level or indeed course level is more meaningful to students when they're making their choices, but can you sensibly disaggregate activity below the institutional level and would the extra burden of doing that outweigh the value that it would create? So that's the kind of debate there may well be about moving to subject level, but it's quite likely there will be some piloting of that during the coming months. The last thing I want to say about the TEP is really, um, it, it, if you look at some of the debate about it at the moment, it's almost seen as a pot into which everything needs to go. So if there's an issue that is of interest, it ought to be a measure in the TEP. Um, and I don't think that's helpful. I think if you look at the duties of the Office for Students, it will be concerned with um, the information that's provided to students. Um, it will be concerned with baseline quality assessment to give assurance. And then assuming the TEF does stay as part of the system and evolves and the Clause 25 survives, it will be concerned with providing ratings. But that doesn't mean that everything needs to be part of the TEF. So, for example, if there is a concern about contact hours, that's not necessarily a quality measure. It may well be an issue about what information is provided to students. And I do think the OFS, if it's going to fulfil the kind of duties that are expected of it, will need to view it in that nuanced way as just one part of the landscape. That's all I want to say. Um, I hope that's given you a sense of what's going on nationally, both in terms of the bill and the TEF. I'm very happy to take any questions that you may have over the next 15 minutes or so. Thank you.